what started the, probably the whiskey making in this area probably was the Scotch-Irish settlers who came here, mostly from Ireland, and they, some of them had been making whiskey and their four parents before that for generations. So it wasn't anything new with them. It's just that when they got to America, the ingredients were a little bit different. We use corn here, where over there they had maybe some other kind of ingredient. But they knew how to make it, they knew how to drink it. It was a great commodity. It was easily divided, improved with age and with a few barrels. You could buy a farm or two, or like, uh, like Abraham Lincoln's father when they moved out of Kentucky into Illinois, I think with a, Illinois, I think with a couple of barrels of whiskey, he bought a farm. A there. horse could carry four gallon, I mean four bushels of shelled corn on his back. But if you distilled it into the liquid corn, you, the horse could carry 24. Uh, the equivalent of 24 bushels. So it was a compelling economic uh, necessity for them. When the Civil War occurred, uh, the federal government decided to impose taxes on whiskey stills, similar to what had happened uh, during the Whiskey Rebellion. Predominantly, they went underground and started, in effect, they didn't pay the tax. They, didn't, they weren't inspected, they weren't registered. During the Depression years, it was a, uh, it was a big thing through this county. And, and of course, the moonshine capital of Georgia was, I mean, of, the, of America and the world was Dawson County, Georgia, just north of here, north, northeast of here. And of course, Wilkes County, Tennessee had the title for a while, and then Cock County. Tennessee, I mean, Wilkes County, North Carolina, Cock County, Tennessee at different periods. But Dawson, well, it was whiskey was really pouring out, mainly going into Atlanta. But um, then you had similar things going into uh, whiskey makers who sent whiskey into Asheville, Knoxville, all the urban centers. They, they started doing land office sweeps through this area, finding uh, Steels that weren't simply steels, they were factories. I remember one in uh, Transylvania County that was underground. The whole thing was underground. It was like a little city down there. You know, and the, the liquor coming out on the end of the run and coming out continually. A lot of the people uh, felt like that it was easy money, you know. And, uh, but it's not easy money. I don't know, if, you know, how much people know about making moonshine, but it's hard work. Uh, first off, you try to find a secluded area where there's running water. Well, if it's secluded, it means it's a good distance from your home or anybody else's home. And then comes your ingredients. You've got to carry in uh, uh, maybe 50 pound, 100 pound, or 200 pound of, uh, of corn, ground corn, uh, and of course sugar, and other ingredients that you need to make whiskey with. Uh, so it, it begins to be a lot of work. For many people in the mountains, uh, economically, it was an act of desperation. It wasn't something they did because they were essentially worthless. It was because they were at the end of the tether, you know. There was nothing else to do, let's bootleg. The moonshiner himself, uh, he knew what he was doing was wrong, but he had, uh, he had, uh, had to make sure he fed his family first and uh, others may not have looked at it as being all that wrong. People needed that money and they needed to buy groceries and needed to buy, need to pay their taxes. And so in the mountains, uh, it was to go up in the holler and find a secluded point in the holler. They frequently had trails into it and they couldn't follow the same trail every day because then anybody could find a trail. So they'd have to cut new trails and come different directions and it had to retain its uh, clandestine uh, appearance in order to su survive. I think the law always had a, a, an ambiguous relationship with bootlegging because it was a fact and they had to live with that. And uh, the fact that it was against the law was something they had to acknowledge. So they had to work out some kind of compromise with them. My grandfather 
considered himself a close friend of the local sheriff, who was uh, Griff Middleton, who's something of a legend in this county. And he was noted for the large number of steals that he brought in and set up outside the courthouse in Jackson County with uh, great holes cut in them, you know, with an ax. Uh, and of course there was a, a kind of a, a charade going on there because he's a very popular sheriff and he knew that he needed to do things that in, indicated that he was cracking down. And he traditionally sent word uh, listen, Charlie, I know you've got a steal in Barker's Creek, and I'm coming Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. Don't be there. And then he would raid the steal and wreck it. And, and uh, that tended to make him a very popular sheriff because he, he was bringing in a lot of steals, but he wasn't arresting anybody. And there was obviously a, uh, a strong feeling in the county that uh, uh, regardless of what you thought about moonshine, people didn't deserve to go to prison for it. One time in particular, we were watching a still uh, fairly close to Table Rock. And uh, so the, the, uh, the state agents, alcohol and tobacco agents were there and they had rigged the dynamite ready to blow the still. And somebody said, get quiet, get quiet, here, here he comes. That was the fellow that owned the still. Well, he come up the path whistling and had a jug in his hand and the rhododendron was everywhere and he's walking in and out of the rhododendron. So, but when he got, if you get within 50 feet of a still, the cops can grab you and, and uh, say that, well, you knew it there or you should have known. But he didn't do that. He was too smart. He turned a little path at the last minute and went off over the hill still whistling. Well, he knew, obviously knew we were there. So uh, they let him go, of course, because he didn't break the law. Uh, so in about three or four or five minutes, that agent had finished his work and he touched that dynamite off and everybody in the mountains heard that still go off. I was offered uh, a job once and I wasn't the only teenager that was offered the job. They said, uh, Jerry, uh, bring your car tomorrow night and park it at Troy's drive-in at midnight and you go in and drink coffee and sit around. And then when you come out, we will have loaded your car. It will be loaded in the trunk. And you are to drive to Grady Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And they gave me the name of a cafe at the hospital and I was to go in and drink some more coffee. And somebody came and unloaded the car and I said, uh, we want to keep it that way because if you're, you're caught, you had no idea that liquor was there. The, the fascination is with the little guy, the little underdog. And he's construed as the underdog, of course, when the, all the police are after him and this kind of thing. And he's off in the woods there alone at night making whiskey in, by a creek bed. Then he's the underdog, you know. Rebellion, you don't tell me what to do. I don't live by your rules. Uh, I didn't ask you to sanction my life. I don't need you to tell me how to live my life. There's a bad streak of that or a good streak in mountain culture.